1991 was an insane year for gaming. At this time, Nintendo was the king of the video game industry, Mario was the video game guy, and no one else stood a chance. That was until Sega launched the Sega Genesis with their brand new mascot's debut game, Sonic the Hedgehog. This thing was f***ing huge, and I really can't stress that enough. Sega was able to do the unthinkable and completely overthrow Nintendo's monopoly on the gaming market. So, from this point onward, Sega and Nintendo were massive rivals. At least, that was until Sega's consoles died. Unfortunately, the Genesis was Sega's only success, at least when it came to consoles. After the Genesis, Sega released both the Saturn and Dreamcast, which both sucked ass. I mean, the hardware wasn't terrible, but the consoles just sold poorly. And unfortunately, this caused Sega to become a third party and exclusively sell games. I mean, hey, maybe this was a good thing, because that just meant that Sega games would be coming to more platforms. Many Sonic games and other Sega games came to PlayStation, Xbox, PC, and of course, Nintendo. Now, back in the early 2000s, this was insane. It was wild that Sega went from being rivals with Nintendo to releasing games on Nintendo hardware only in the span of a decade. It all started with Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. This was a simple port of the Dreamcast game, and I mean, hey, it was great that they were porting the adventure games because not many people were able to play them. But SA2 Battle also included the addition of brand new multiplayer modes along with skins for the characters. This was a cool addition because multiplayer was always a huge deal on Nintendo consoles, which is one of the reasons why this game was exclusive to the GameCube for the longest time. Yeah, it wasn't even on PlayStation or Xbox, only GameCube. Of course, nowadays you can play SA2 on Steam, Xbox, and even PS3, but back in 2001, this was crazy. Fast forward to 2003 and Sega released Sonic Adventure DX Director's Cut, which was a complete remaster of the original game, albeit with some issues. I mean, the visuals were definitely upgraded, depending on who you ask, and the frame rate was doubled, but there was a huge lack of polish. So many bugs that just weren't present in the original game. But hey, at least they included the ability to play some Game Gear games, that's pretty neat I guess. Alright, that's enough talking about ports though. What about actual Nintendo exclusive games that never saw the light of day on any other console? Well, I hate to break it to you friends, but most of them suck. First we have the Sonic Advance Trilogy. I don't want to spend too much time talking about the Advance games because while yes, they're exclusive to Nintendo systems, they're handheld games, which means that they couldn't really be on any other console if you get what I'm saying. Anyway, we got a total of three Sonic Advance games on the Game Boy Advance. Now, this was massive, because similar to a game like New Super Mario Bros., people were hyping this game up because everyone was considering it to be the fourth 2D Sonic game. And then everyone realized that the trilogy just isn't that good. This is really the first Sonic project that Dems had any involvement with. And, damn, it wasn't pretty. The level design, for one, was just terrible. Countless bottomless pits, poor enemy placement, you get the idea. A lot of people really cherish the Sonic Advance series, and I can respect that, but I never really liked the games. Now, the Sonic Rush series, on the other hand, is fantastic. Now, it shares many of the issues that the Advance series has, like the bottomless pits and whatnot, and it has its own issues as well, but I absolutely love the Rush series of games, and if you ask me, these are some of the best 2D Sonic games. Yeah. 2D Sonic games. A lot of people often forget about Rush Adventure's existence, because honestly, I don't really know. It's very unfortunate too, because this game is honestly better than Rush 1. Go argue with a wall. Now, of course, because these games were on the DS, they had the opportunity to take advantage of all of the cool shit that the DS could do. The games constantly switch between the top and bottom screens, which is a fantastic way of utilizing the feature. Multiple segments also use touchscreen controls, mainly the special stages in the first game and the water vehicle segments in the second. They made sure they took advantage of absolutely everything the DS is capable of, but at the same time, the gimmicky stuff doesn't feel forced. I can't say the same about Sonic and the Secret Rings, though. This game f***ing sucks. The storybook series. There's a reason why I haven't covered these two games on the channel yet. The Wii was the shit at this time, and Sega wanted to capitalize off of all of its cool gimmicks as much as possible. So they thought, why not make a Sonic game that's almost entirely controlled with motion controls? And that's how Sonic and the Secret Rings was born. So while Sonic 06 was being developed, they realized that they weren't going to be able to get the Wii version done in time. So instead of doing what any normal company would do and, you know, delay the game, what they did was split Sonic Team in half so one half could work on 06 while the other made a completely new game for the Wii, and that's part of the reason why both of these games suck. Sonic and the Secret Rings does a lot of things right, don't get me wrong. The music, the visuals, the level environments, the cutscenes, hell, even the story. But when it comes to the actual gameplay, it's terrible. So this game is designed around motion controls. You tilt the Wii Remote forward, backward, left and right to move Sonic while he automatically runs forward. You can also shake the Wii Remote to do things like homing attack and boost and whatnot. Really, the only button that serves any purpose in this game is the 2 button. 
which is what you use to jump, but none of the other buttons are used. Now this concept is cool for like a mobile game, but for a full ass console game developed in house, this is awful. Maybe if they got the motion controls right, it wouldn't be so bad, but as it is now, these controls are terrible. It doesn't help that your inputs don't even register half the time, and I always see the argument that if they added standard controller support, then this game would be good, but that's not true in the slightest. Using a controller mod on an emulator, the game still suffers from poor movement in general. They designed how Sonic moves around the motion controls. Is playing with a controller better? I mean, I guess, but it's still clunky as hell. I'm also not really a fan of the mission-based structure of the game. I don't like having to go back and play random missions in order to progress the story. If the missions were actually fun, then it wouldn't be an issue. But you have to do random things like collecting rings and defeating a certain number of enemies. It's nothing that warrants these being separate missions and not just hidden objectives within the main acts. It's really weird because the idea of Seeker Rings is really neat and quite interesting, but they just had to ruin it by forcing awful gameplay into the mix. But at least things were somewhat improved in Sonic and the Black Knight. Honestly, I'm just surprised that they continued the storybook series after the disaster that Secret Rings was. But anyway, if they fixed all of Secret Rings' issues in Black Knight, then we could have a very good game on our hands. Yeah. If. Okay, I gotta give Black Knight some credit because it does improve the controls a ton. You no longer use tilt controls to move Sonic, but instead you use the Wii Mode and Nunchuck combo, which lets you use an actual thumbstick, you know, like a normal game. But even with this, the movement still feels a lot like Secret Rings. Sonic has the same movement with some slight improvements, but it's not enough to make the gameplay in Black Knight feel drastically different. However, I agree with everyone else when I say that everything else in this game is so much better than how it was in Secret Rings. This is the last game with the four kids voice acting, which kinda sucks cause this is by far Jason Griffith's best Sonic performance. The story of the game also complements this very well. There are a lot of hidden themes and messages spread throughout the plot. It's fantastic. The storybook like cutscenes are here as well, but they're much more animated this time around, which is a very nice addition. But of course, I gotta acknowledge that, yeah. Sonic has a sword. Is it a big deal? Not really. Sure, it gets tiring having to violently shake the Wiimote every 5 seconds, but it's way better than using motion controls for absolutely everything like you had to in Secret Rings. Still though, I think the sword gimmick was only put in place to give something that uses the motion controls. I mean, it gives this game a unique identity by introducing a new gimmick, but it's very clear that they wanted to add something that used the Wii's motion controls. Other than that though, I still think this game is pretty mediocre at best. I don't know man, it's just the game playing controls that make the game kind of boring. I do like the medieval aesthetic of the game, but this ain't it. I think they should have put all of these ideas in a game that has actual fun gameplay, you know? But hey, at least the game is fucking playable. That's a plus. Then we have Sonic Colors, which to this day is one of my favorite Sonic games. Now, I don't know why this game was exclusive to Nintendo consoles. As far as I know, there wasn't any exclusivity deal or anything of that sort, but okay. Anyway, I love Sonic Colors because this is just a very fun game. They released this game on the Wii in the DS, and both versions are two completely different games for the most part. The Wii version is your traditional 3D Sonic Boost game, while the DS version has the same gameplay as the Sonic Rush duo. Now, I think that the Wii version is the better game, but a lot of people say the DS version is better, and for good reason. But let's start with the Wii version. This was marketed as an evolution of sorts to the Sonic Unleashed daytime stages. They just wanted to improve upon the design concept that was seen in Sonic Unleashed they failed miserably. Okay, look, I don't think the level design and colors is bad, not at all, but it isn't nearly on the same level as Unleashed. There is a lot of fluff in here, a bunch of 2D platforming sections, weird gameplay mechanics, and of course, the wisps. Now, back in colors, these were nothing more than cool little power-ups. It's just the fact that they kept bringing them back for an entire decade is why people don't like these things. But in colors, they were fine. Other than that though, the story is not that good. This is the beginning of what the community dubbed as the meta era for Sonic's stories, and that's because the writing was sh**. But then we have the DS version. Uh it's pretty good. It's just more Rush, so if you like those games, you'll like this one. But of course, this game has the Wisps as well, which are only used in scripted segments, but it's whatever. You also have more abilities than you did in the Rush games, those being the homing attack and stomp. But yeah, Colors was and still is a great game. Until it wasn't. Not gonna talk about Colors Ultimate too much because, uh, it isn't a Nintendo exclusive game anymore, but this game was so broken at launch. Nowadays, the bugs are toned down a lot, but we're still at the point where we need fan made mods to make the game look halfway decent. This is a remaster, but with an asterisk. So, yeah, this is by far one of the worst remasters Sega has ever put out, and I really hope they learn their lesson from this when they eventually decide to remaster Unleashed, assuming they're planning on doing that. Anyway, jump to 2013 and we have 
have Sonic Lost World, which in the eyes of many, is THE Nintendo Sonic game. This was the beginning of Nintendo's exclusivity deal with Sega, where they would release three Sonic games exclusive to Nintendo platforms. This game is quite literally a Mario 3D World clone. The design is bright and poppy, the level environments are your standard grass, desert, snow, you get the idea, and the gameplay isn't that fast. So they ditched the boost gameplay for this one, and instead they gave Sonic this new parkour system where you can run on walls and such. Now when you get the hang of it, this is pretty fun, and I can say the same about the entirety of Lost World's gameplay. Despite the story, level environments, and all of that being bad, the gameplay in Sonic Lost World is still very fun if you ask me. But I understand the criticism this game gets, because since this game was a Wii U and 3DS exclusive, they felt the need to drain all of what made the Sonic series unique up until this point. But I still think Lost World is a load of fun. At least the Wii U version is. The 3DS version of the game is something that I'll probably never go back to. Is it unplayable? No, not in the slightest. But there are so many awful gimmicks in this version. The gameplay is relatively the same, but with Dimps at the helm of the project, this game is naturally prone to Dimps things. Bad level design, trashy stage gimmicks, you know, the whole nine yards. I see a lot of people saying that the 3DS version is actually better than the Wii U version, and to that, I say, why? But yeah. Sonic Lost World was just a mixed bag for many people, because it just felt kind of unoriginal. We needed something different, something unique for the Sonic series. Oh f I take it back. The Sonic Boom trilogy of games is honestly very nostalgic for me, but the games are mostly pretty bad. Now the development of the Wii U game, Rise of Lyric, deserves a video of its own, because unfortunately, this is one of the many circumstances where Sega completely screwed over the developer. Long story short, Big Red Button was not given the creative freedom with this game. Also, this game wasn't meant to be a Wii U exclusive, in fact, it wasn't meant to be on the Wii U in the first place. They planned for this thing to be on PS4 and Xbox One, until Sega came in literally months before before the game was supposed to launch and told them that they had to get it running on the Wii U. Then everything went to sh** pretty much. I'll explain why in a minute, but for me, the reason why Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric is a garbage game is because of the performance. There are countless frame drops and slowdown, it's awful. You could tell that this was never supposed to be on this hardware. However, if you play this game on an emulator with 60 FPS and no frame drops, this game is just kind of boring at best. For one, Sonic and crew are not fast in this game at all. Along with that, the combat is very generic and lifeless. You just kind of mash buttons and hope for the best. There are also these generic puzzles where you have to hit some switches and whatnot. Yeah. Pretty boring stuff. There are also these speed sections now and again, which are pretty fun, but that's the only fun thing in this game. Everything else is just pretty boring. There are like 10 levels in this game, with each of them taking upwards of 10 minutes to beat, but really, they feel like 45 minutes. The gameplay loop is just not fun. You fight some enemies, do some puzzles, and rinse and repeat, really. I do have to give credit where credit is due, though. Everything outside of the gameplay is honestly pretty good. The environments in this game are absolutely stunning, and they aren't generic like the ones we see in Lost World. The animation and writing are also fantastic. It's comedic like Colors in Lost World, but it's actually funny this time around. It just really sucks because looking at pre-launch footage, this game looked way better. Cool looking puzzles, fun looking combat, this game had a ton of potential, but unfortunately, Sega's greediness caused this game to be absolutely dog shit in the end. But then we have Shattered Crystal and Fire and Ice, which are the two 3DS games. Shattered Crystal launched along with Rise of Lyric, and it was not that good. Now this is a very generic 2D platformer, with Sonic of course, but this was damn near a metroidvania at times, and I like a lot of metroidvanias, but this one is bad. Exploration is required, and that wouldn't really be an issue if this game wasn't boring, but the developers of this game, Sanzaru Games, aimed to fix all of the issues in the game's sequel, Fire and Ice, which even got delayed to make the game better, and yeah, it's pretty fun. The level design is much better in this game. Exploration is still encouraged, but it isn't required, and the introduction of the fire and ice mechanic makes the level design more fun as well. This is just a very solid 2D platformer, and part of me wishes that Big Red Button had the chance to make a sequel to Rise of Lear, while fixing all of that game's issues as well. But, oh well. But with that, that's pretty much every Nintendo exclusive Sonic game. It turns out that a lot of these games aren't very good, but a lot of them are actually hidden gems. But let me know what you all think about these games in the comments down below. Do you like Lost World? Do you like Rush? Hell, maybe you even have a guilty pleasure for Rise of Lyric. Which would be kind of weird, right? Like, <laughs> I totally don't. But that's all for me, guys. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all later. Goodbye.